Teaching, Reason, and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Friday night. Got something special for y'all. I told you it was going to happen. Hold on. Let me turn on the music for it. Hold on. We got to get ready with the big easy theme that I made here. This is a little bit of Louisiana flavor. We are going to review Stephen Anderson, Jesse Lee Patterson conversation. Yes. <laughs> wow. If you have not heard this conversation, you're going to enjoy this one. This is going to be fun. Yeah, so uh, back in 2019, I gather, uh, Anderson and Patterson both had an exchange about 20 minutes long, <clears throat> I guess, on uh, Patterson's show, where they talk about the Bible, sin, and homosexuality. <clears throat> wow. Several years old, but new to me. I watched it the other day. I think somebody sent it to me. One of our patrons or fans. Somebody sent it to me. And I was captivated the entire time by how wrong both Patterson and Anderson were in theological matters. I mean, they were both a train wreck. <laughs> and there were, there were two trains running into each other. <laughs> And then just falling off the train tracks and just <clears throat> and then they put the trains back on the tracks and then they came back and hit each other again and fell off the tracks again. I mean, it was just a, an ordeal that you just could not stop watching. I found it to be hilarious <laughs> and dreadful at the same time. <laughs> dreadful theology from both of them, but hilarious as far as just entertainment. Um, <clears throat> so on a Friday night here, we need a little levity. That's what we're going to do. We're going to watch the, uh, conversation or debate, whatever you want to call it, uh, argument, <laughs> something, <laughs> whatever this thing was, we're going to watch it together and I'm going to, you know, pause on occasion and offer some commentary. All right, let's get to it. Let me share my screen here. Let me know if y'all have any issues with the audio. All right, let's get to it. I have uh, Pastor Stephen Anderson with me, and I interviewed Pastor Anderson on my TV show, The Fallen State TV. You can check it out, The Fallen State TV. And this is the first time I've had him on my radio show. He is a Baptist pastor and the founder of Faithful Word Baptist church out of uh arizona he has a really unique way of speaking where is he from faithful word baptist church 10 p arizona <clears throat> arizona 10 p arizona just want to talk to him a few minutes and then i get back to your calls i want to talk to him about conservative issue morality and all the good things um uh pastor anderson thank you for coming on the radio show yeah, thanks for having me on. I do appreciate it. How have you been? I'm doing great. Yeah. Everything's going well. Um, yesterday, I just got banned from the Netherlands. And then uh, now the Netherlands has made it so that I can't go anywhere in Europe. Imagine so that. Stephen Anderson being banned somewhere. I wonder why. So I'm actually banned from 31 countries now. Amazing. And why did they ban you? Well, they said it was for hate speech. And what was the hate speech that they were referring to? Preaching against homosexuals. Oh, I see. Um, and are you disappointed <laughs> that you're banned? No, not at all. And why not? Well, because the event that we had planned in the Netherlands and the event in Sweden, those, those events are still going to go forward. I had other backup <laughs> preachers in place. And it's not that I was just dying to go to Europe. Or to well, you know, I didn't like your stupid country anyway, so I don't really care that you banned me. <laughs> visit these places. You know, I was going there to try to minister to the people there and preach to them and, 
and evangelize. So it's 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 really no skin off my back. It's it's their problem. Did they send you a note that you were bad? Yeah, the the DHL man came and and brought it to the church building. Ooh, DHL! Wow, they're going the cheap route, I guess. And yesterday morning, like a courier brought a, a letter explaining that I was banned. Amazing! How did they know you were coming? Well, because I've been advertising it, putting videos on YouTube. We've been trying to promote these uh, preaching events that are coming up at the end of May. Oh, okay. And when you call by God, or did you have to go to school to be a preacher? That was a very odd shift. Amazing, as uh, Batterson says. But okay, here we go. We're now shifting from, you know, the formalities and blah, blah, blah. Now we're going to get to the interesting stuff. Here it is. Well, I believe that I'm called by God, but the Bible says if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good work. If any be blameless, the husband and one wife, etc. So I believe that if you have the desire and you meet the qualifications, you may volunteer to preach God's word. And so I, I consider myself a volunteer. Amazing. And so, so were you called by God? I didn't have some kind of a supernatural call experience, but I do believe in retrospect that I am called. And so were you called by God? Yes. Okay. In uh, retrospect, yes. In retrospect. What does that mean, in retrospect, you were? It means that because I followed the Bible's command that if I desired the office of a bishop and meet the qualifications that I should. You heard that right. Anderson thinks he's a bishop. I should do that, and then I did that, and then God has blessed. So looking back, it's clear that I'm called. Although I did, I didn't have some experience where the whole room lit up and an angel came and told me that I was called or something like that. Do you think that that's what it means to be called by God to have that type of experience? Absolutely not. But that's what a lot of people think that it means. So that's why oh, I, I see. clarify that. Yeah. Uh, are you? Do you sin? Yes, I do. You, what type of sins do you commit? We didn't actually have to ask him that. I mean, you can just watch any sermon from Anderson, and you can know the answer to that one. Well, the Bible says there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And the Bible says that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And here we're going we're gonna to hear a million, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, which I'm all about quoting scripture because I think that that's the principal source of theology. So I have no problem with appealing to scripture. But what you're going to see is a very poor understanding of scripture on part of not only Anderson, but also Patterson. And the truth is not in us. Uh -huh. The Bible also says that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. So obviously God is not scourging his sons for doing the right things. He's scourging his sons because they sin, because everyone sins. What type of sins do you commit? Well, I'm, I'm not going to sit here like in a confessional booth and, and recite my sins to you. And why not? <laughs> Because that would be highly inappropriate. And you <laughs> he asked the question. I mean, as if he thought that it was a legitimate question. And why not? Why? Why not just pretend that I'm a Catholic priest or something? <laughs> do you tell others at your church not to sin, or do you tell them that it's okay to sin? I tell them not to sin. But why are you telling them not to if you are sinning yourself? Because every apostle in the New Testament told people not to sin, and they all sinned themselves. So I'm following the example of the apostles and prophets who were all sinners and yet preached for people not to sin. And did those people sin? And I would agree with Anderson that just because a person sins themselves doesn't mean that they can't uh, tell other people or call other people to the standard that God expects of them. But of course, if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that you're doing your best to meet that standard as well. And once they, the, uh, the ones in the Bible, the prophets, did they sin once they were born again? Absolutely. Since the apostle Paul, were the prophets born again? The prophets had not received the Holy Spirit. I mean, not the Holy Spirit in so far as the way in which we receive the Holy Spirit. You could see in the Old Testament them receiving the Holy Spirit in so far as giving them skills to build the tabernacle and things like that. Um, and you do see David talk about 
um, you know, the Holy Spirit and, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Um, so obviously the Holy Spirit was at work with people in the Old Testament, but not in the way in which he is, is uh, present with somebody who is baptized in the new covenant. I think that there is a important distinction there. So when we talk about born again, being regenerated, I don't believe that they were regenerated in the way that were regenerated, according to John 3. Um, in the New Testament. Now, I'm willing to be corrected on that, but I think that this is something that is new to the New Covenant. Paul wrote Romans chapter 7 and talked about his continual struggle with sin and continually doing the things that he hates as he's writing the epistle to the Romans. And so and when, when he said that, was he saying that, oh, I am now born again and I still sin? Absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. And what is the purpose of being born again of God if you're still going to be sinning? So you're, you're hearing this right. Um, Patterson is going to take the view that if you're born again, you don't sin anymore, which is, of course, absurd. And he's going to base it on a misunderstanding of First John. I mean, you, you probably saw that coming. So, but I mean, the, the guy actually believes that if you are a Christian, at least according to scripture, you're not going to sin anymore, which again is absurd. So I would actually agree with Anderson where he's going to fall on this particular side of the debate. But um, both of them, as you're going to see, are woefully and dreadfully in the air when it comes to theological matters. Just uh, we'll, we'll continue to watch and you'll see that. If, because sin is Satan's nature. Why would you be bothered being born again if you're still going to be sin? And all those who sin are slaves to sin. Those who sin are slaves to sin. Those are, pe those are people who are sinning habitually. I don't think that that's necessarily what a Christian is doing, although we could speak about Christians frequently sinning. And, okay, um, if it's grave enough, they need to be reconciled. They need to be restored because they return to bondage, if you will. What's the purpose of being born again? Well, the Bible says that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So being born again is the prerequisite for entering the kingdom of God or for going to heaven. So but you believe, that, do you believe that sinners will enter the kingdom of heaven? No, I do not. Well, well how can you see the kingdom of heaven then if you're a sinner? Because of the fact that when we get born again, our body is not born again. Our flesh. Oh, whoa. Oh, oh, man. Hold on. Oh, let me. This is Protestant theology for you. Our body isn't born again. <laughs> um, so our bodies aren't going to be redeemed. I mean, there, there's the body doesn't in any way participate in the work of redemption here and now. I mean, is this just something that's post resurrection or something? The body in no way is redeemed. Now we're literally going to completely separate the spirit from the body in this sharp and drastic of a way. Now, He's going to do this because he misunderstands what Paul talks about when he speaks about the flesh, the flesh profiting for nothing and things like that. Um, the flesh is actually not to be identified technically with the body, though. Um, that That is noteworthy. The flesh, what Paul is talking about there, is not 100% equal to the body. Um, so the theology here is atrocious, but... Oh, okay. Let, let's move forward. Flesh is not born again. Only our spirit is born again. Oh. So my flesh. Oh. oh, man. Clearing out my ears. Hold on. Oh, man. Is there some holy water around here to splash in my ears? Wow. Wow. You know, I remember when I was a Protestant, I wouldn't have thought twice about what he just said there. But as someone who thinks more sacramentally now as a Catholic. Whew. My spirit is saved. My body isn't. Yeah, I don't think that that's what Paul is getting at. But the question still remains, okay, well, if you're born again, why do you still sin? Well, it's called concupiscence, right? You still have that um, tendency sometimes to be tempted in that direction and then if your will then consents to it then you choose to do so um so you choose to go with what your 
concupiscence is kind of tempting you towards. Um, and at that point, okay, if, if it's a really grave sin, you're, you're going to need to be restored to God's grace. Um, but the point is this, if we're born again, we should not be doing these things, right? We should never sully our baptism. We should never sully the grace that we've been given. We should not sin. So I actually want to say, in a sense, Patterson is right insofar as if we're born again, we should not sin. But the sad reality is sometimes we do consent to those things. And if it's grave enough, um, we need to be restored and reconciled to God through the sacrament of confession. Um, so, yeah, there, there is that tension that's taking place here on earth. I, I would grant that side to anderson but it doesn't it but i'm not going to go to the other extreme and say well because of concupiscence or because i might uh consent to a sin that somehow means that my body is in no way redeemed and blood is not going to go to heaven the part of me that is sinful the flesh is going to die and go into the earth and my perfect regenerated sinless soul is going to go to heaven but that's in this interim period. There is the resurrection. That's not going to be your natural state. Your natural state is to be an embodied spirit. Your natural state is not to be disembodied as a human. So, I mean, that might be characteristic of this interim period. Uh, but that's definitely not going to be the case after the resurrection. So, I mean, what about the body after the resurrection? And so the spirit doesn't control the body? Well, when the spirit controls the body, that's when we do what's right and don't sin. But when we walk in the flesh, then we fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the Bible says the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And these. But here he's equating flesh with body. I want you to take note of that. They're not the same. They're contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. So my spirit is saved and going to heaven, but my flesh is still unregenerate. And that's. Bah! Whoa! My flesh is still unregenerate. Oh, well, again, aside from the misunderstanding of the term flesh and confusing it with the body, um, he would effectively say his body is unregenerate. But you know what? It kind of follows if you deny baptismal regeneration, right? But as a Christian, Christians always believed in baptismal regeneration. This idea that some Protestants have come up with denying baptismal regeneration is so novel. It is a human tradition against a divine tradition. It is against sacred scripture. It is against the unanimous consent of the fathers on this. And believe me, the fathers don't generally consent unanimously on a lot of things. This is one of them they agree on, baptismal regeneration. And it's very clear in scripture. Uh, Romans 6, 1 through 4. Let's just start there. I mean, that's really good uh, place to go. Titus 3, 5 is another one. Acts 2, 38 through 39 is another. And there's many others. Um, baptismal regeneration is clearly a patristic and apostolic um, doctrine. To say that the body then is not regenerated um, is so Gnostic. Um, and thinking that it is just, it's offensive to even hear it <laughs> as a Catholic who, who thinks in terms of baptismal regeneration and the sacraments. Um, once you get on that wavelength, it ma scripture makes so much more sense. The fathers make sense. You, you, you get into that wavelength, if you will, that stream, and then all of a sudden you're jolted and thrown out into another stream of somebody saying something completely different, and it just, it just shocks you. <laughs> That's why I still sin, because I'm in the flesh. And so now that you're born again, you're, you're a pastor of God. So does that mean that your spirit in no way consents to the... Um, to the uh, sins that you engage in. I I'm just curious. Is, is that what he thinks? His spirit has no consent. It has no will. I mean, what, what is he saying? And you're born again. Are there moments where your spirit is not controlling your body because you're sinning? Absolutely. How do you, how is it that your spirit isn't controlling your body because you're sinning? No, your spirit is giving itself over to the body. We could speak of it 
like that, okay, but it doesn't mean that your body has somehow taken over your spirit. This is just both of them are are way off base for even speaking in these terms. The spirit, once you're born again and your spirit is now of God, how is it that it has moments when it's sinning, when it's not controlling the body? Because how does sin overcome this, overtake the spirit if you're now of God? Because every single day we have to die to self. Paul said, I die daily. We have to deny self and take up the cross and follow him. And so if we don't make a conscious effort to mortify the flesh, the flesh will be in charge in our lives. And if it were automatic, that just being saved or being born again just automatically makes you walk in the Spirit, then he wouldn't have to tell us over and over again, be filled with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, don't give in to the lust of the flesh. He wouldn't have to give us all those commands. Oh, he doesn't tell you over and over to do it. He's just telling you what to do. When you... um. When you, um, what does it, in John, I believe somewhere in John, the Bible says that. It's not John, it's First John. Uh, if any man or woman say that they, of, of God, that they've been born again of God, but they still sin, that they are a liar and the truth is not in them. For this reason, Christ came that you should not sin because sin is of your father, the devil. How do you explain that? Does away? Patterson really think he doesn't sin? I mean, I'm just curious. Does does he really believe that? <laughs> well, number one, you're misquoting that scripture. That's not what it says. Amazing. And number two, and you have to get the context of First John. In chapter one, he already told you, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves in the truth. And Anderson's right here. First John does speak about if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he's speaking to Christians, people who've already been regenerated through baptism. Um, so it, it's clearly in the context of somebody who's already been redeemed. Uh, so first John, I would agree with Anderson, does say that we still sin, but then it talks about us not sinning insofar as if if we're if we are um walking in the ways of the spirit, we're not going to sin gravely, habitually, those those kinds of things. Truth is not in us. So you're taking that out of context and you totally misquoted that scripture. There's no mention of being born again. You're totally twisting that scripture when, you it, that it, correctly and then I'll respond to it. How do you explain a way that it says that if you are born of God, you cannot sin because sin is of your father, the devil? How do you explain that away? I don't explain it away. I explain it the right way, which is to say that that part of me that is born again, which is my spirit, cannot sin. But, but since my flesh is not born again, my flesh can still sin. But it says that you cannot sin if you've been born again of God. It doesn't separate the flesh from the spirit because the spirit can co control the flesh. And so it's not separating one. How? Why are you separating the flesh from the sin if it's the, uh, I mean, from the uh, spirit? It's the spirit that control the flesh. That's why when you're born again, he take the sinful spirit away from you, and now you're controlled by uh, the spirit of God, which is not of sin. Why are you separating the, the two? The entire New Testament separates the flesh and the spirit. Again and again, he talks about these are the works of the flesh, these are the fruit of the spirit, you've got to walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And so the Bible makes this distinction over and over again. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, when I do that, I would not. It's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Amazing. Okay. And what? it, what's amazing is that you actually believe that you don't sin. That's that's borderline insanity. Amazing. It's, so it's what, what would... It's ridiculous that you teach that. What would happen to you as a pastor and as a born-again Christian if the moment come, right at the moment where you are sinning, and the moment come and you die, will you still go to heaven? Absolutely. You will go to heaven even though you're sinning and dying? Absolutely. And why Again, notice no distinction between grave sins and venial sins here, of course. Obviously, we would expect that. But, but, but all those who sin cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why would he let you in? That's habitual sin. That's grave sin. 
because my soul is going to heaven, Amazing. my flesh is going to stay behind. It's a... <laughs> not a good answer, Anderson. <laughs> possible you're wrong? Absolutely not. Because Jesus... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is it possible you're wrong? Absolutely not. This is the problem with Anderson that I've noticed before. Uh, whenever I was first listening to this, um, I was not really taken back by that response, even though you would think that a person would be taken back by saying uh, when, whenever they hear somebody say that, no, it's not possible they could be wrong. You would think, wow, what, what a delusional person. Um, <clears throat> I've noticed this about Anderson. He he equates his understanding of the Bible with the Bible itself. And he doesn't recognize that there could be a difference there. And the reason why he doesn't believe that is because he believes, well, if I have the Holy Spirit and my sheep hear my voice, <clears throat> as you know, he's clearly going to twist those scriptures, um, then he couldn't possibly misunderstand scripture. So this is why he equates his interpretation of scripture with scripture itself. So he doesn't think that he could possibly be wrong. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Nothing could separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I've been passed from death unto life. I shall not come into condemnation. I have everlasting life. And so no matter what happens, I'm going to heaven because I have believed on the name of the only begotten son of God. I'm saved by grace through faith, not by works. But sin is death. Don't you agree to that? Or do you agree to that? No, I don't. You don't agree that sin is death? No, I don't. Really? And are you saying that the flesh... I mean, sin brings death, but they're obviously not the same thing. Is stronger than the spirit? It depends on the person. So with you, your flesh is stronger than your spirit? You know what? You're using man's logic. I quoted a bunch of scripture to you, and you're believing damnable heresy of sinless perfection. It's nonsense. It's ridiculous. Man's logic. Yeah, you'll you'll recall from previous episodes we review. Um, he does not think very well of man's capability to think and his logic. And it's true that scripture does speak negative negatively sometimes about um philosophy and logic and things of that sort, but it's it's talking about corrupted thinking, it's talking about bad philosophy. It's not condemning all forms of philosophy or all forms of logic and reasoning and human reason, you know, all together. It's it's condemning bad and sinful human reasoning as opposed to uh, philosophy that's done um, in accord with Scripture or, or human reasoning that is done by somebody who is grace filled that is, again, in accord with Scripture. Um, but he, again, is going to twist those scriptures uh, that speak about vain philosophies and reasoning and is going to then say that all form of reasoning and philosophy is somehow corrupt and evil. And so that's kind of where this this is coming from when it comes to Anderson. And you know what? The Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves because you're not deceiving anyone else. You're only deceiving yourself because I know you're a sinner. So, Everybody knows you're a sinner. You're only deceiving yourself if you're actually foolish enough to think that you have no sin. And so are you saying that your flesh is stronger than your spirit? And that's why you sin. Well, you're, you're trying to put strange words in my mouth. I'm asking a question. That's a question. It's not put a word. The Bible says avoid foolish questions, and that's a foolish question. So I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> so i mean could could we then apply that to anderson anytime he goes around asking people questions at doors whenever he knocks on their door and tries to evangelize well the bible just says to avoid foolish questions and you're giving me foolish questions here he's obviously not going to accept that he's going to say well no i'm not i'm giving you uh reasonable questions here and so okay well if you're going to afford yourself that luxury why won't you give that to people like patterson answer your foolish question so you're not going to answer if you're saying that the, your flesh is stronger than your spirit and that's why you sin you won't answer that i'm not going to answer your foolish question okay that's not the way the bible phrases it you're twisting scripture you're teaching a false doctrine a damnable i mean listen to this a person who himself teaches damnable heresies and false doctrine i mean if there ever is a person who is heterodox it's anderson 
Um, and then he's over here blasting Patterson for his heterodoxy, which he is heterodox. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not saying that the guy's orthodox, but what I am saying is it's the kettle calling the pot, you know, black or whatever the phrase is. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just amazing to see this. Amazing. Well, heresy. It was just a question. Uh, you <laughs> said you said that you sin. And are you saying that your flesh is stronger than your spirit, and that's why you sin? Well, allow me to avoid your foolish questions, since the Bible commands me to avoid foolish questions. So you won't answer that? No, I won't. Um, do you love the homosexuals? No, I do not. I hate homosexuals, and I wish that they would all die. And why do you hate them? Because the Bible portrays them as violent predators. From start to finish and if we look at reality they are violent predators they're recruiters they're not reproducers they're recruiters i i get the feeling that anderson has been wounded in the past um i i don't want to speculate too much but i get the feeling there's some history here and there's some hurt by somebody who was homosexual i i get that impression but we'll leave it at that. And so the Bible says that they should be executed. And I believe the Bible and I hate them and wish that they would all die. And can a man of God hate? Well, I'm a man of God and I hate. So there's proof that a man of God can hate David. <laughs> so delusional. He's going to use himself as a standard for a man of God. And so if he does something, it's got to be something that a man of God does because, hey, I'm the man of God. I mean, wow, how delusional could you be? Pre-list anybody? The man after God's own heart said, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. And I'm not, I grieve with them that rise up against thee. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. That's Psalm 139, verses 18 through 21. So are you hate saying, it. Are, it. are you saying, yes, a man who has been born again of God can still hate? Absolutely. I'm born again. King David was born again. So if you are a hater and you love God, how can you hate, how can you judge the homosexuals? You're no different than the ones you're judging. Well, of course, somebody could say that there's a difference between a, the grave sin of homosexuality and maybe be venial sins that a person might engage in, right? I mean, so uh, we, we could make distinctions here. Um, so, it, you know, somebody who is living um, in a state of grace, uh, they, they, they might still sub sin venially, of course, but uh, that's not going to be on the level of, um, you know, grave sins, uh, adultery. Um, you know, uh, homosexuality, murder, uh, you know, stuff like that. It, it's, there's a difference obviously between certain sins and others. Although again, these two Protestants, uh, presume Patterson is a Protestant. Um, these two guys aren't going to, you know, recognize the distinction between venial and mortal sins. They think that any kind of sin is equally grave, which is absolutely absurd. Um, there, there is no reasonable way to say that every sin is equally grave in the eyes of God. That is incredibly absurd. Uh, yes, every sin offends a just and holy God, but some sins offend him more than others. And that's even clear in scripture. That's another foolish question. God hates homosexuals. So... This idea that hate is wrong is a stupid liberal talking point because there are 21 verses in the Bible that directly talk about God hating people. King David hated Sounds like he's had to look them up and count them before. <laughs> Think he's maybe had this conversation? <laughs> people. The Bible commands us to love the good and hate the evil. So you, your question doesn't make sense. So you feel justified as a man of God and a preacher hating the homosexuals and you think that's what god want you to do no i don't feel justified i know i am justified Amazing. i know for a fact that that's what god wants me to do second chronicles 19 2 says shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the lord therefore is wrath upon me from uh, upon thee from the lord thy god if you love those who hate the lord bible says you'll have god's wrath on you and so, and so sure hate those who hate him and should people hate you because you sin as well? Should you be hated for it? 
Absolutely not, no. Why should you be hated if you're sinning and you hate the homosexuals who are sinning? What's the difference? Because I love the Lord and the homosexuals hate God. And the Bible says, I hate them that hate the Lord. So okay. you have a love-hate relationship with God? Absolutely. That doesn't follow from what Anderson said. Absolutely not. I only love God, and I hate homosexuals. Have you ever seen God? I have not physically seen God, but I have seen God. Have you physically seen homosexuals? Yes. So how can you love a God whom you've never seen and hate your fellow man who you have seen? Well, there you go, twisting scripture again, because the Bible actually says, if a man say he loved God and hated his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth God whom he hath not seen, it says, if you don't love your brother whom you have seen. Homosexuals are not my brothers because they're not sons of God. They're not children of God. You've twisted. Remember, he does not believe that homosexuals can be regenerated or redeemed. Because uh, he believes that a person who is homosexual is reprobate which of course romans 1 does say that but of course it also says gossipers and every pretty much every other kind of sin is somebody who is reprobate the problem is um he misunderstands what a reprobate mind is he has this misunderstanding that a reprobate mind is a mind that could no longer be converted that's not true that is a human tradition by once again, by Protestants who don't know scripture very well, um, because if um, the person with the reprobate mind of Romans one cannot be converted, nobody can be converted because it mentions pretty much every sin that humanity engages in in Romans one. And then it says that these are the people that are turned over to a reprobate mind. So if you want to say, well, reprobate mind is somebody who can never be re regenerated or saved or redeemed or re repent of their sins. Uh, nobody can then. Obviously, we need to change our definition of what a reprobate mind means at that point. Clearly, it just means a distorted mind, a sinful mind. But we should know from experience, our distorted and sinful minds have been redeemed. Have, have they not? Are our minds not being renewed by Christ? Yeah. Okay, so that's all Romans 1 is talking about. Somebody being turned over to a reprobate mind doesn't mean that you could not repent and be redeemed. Uh, so it's absurd. So here he's going to appeal to that in, in just a moment to Romans 1, but it shows that he doesn't understand what he's appealing to. The scripture there, if anybody actually looks it up there in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, they'll see that you've twisted the word brother into fellow man. Homosexuals are not my brother. How, can you, how yeah. can you say you love God of whom you never see and hate your fellow man who you have seen? Can you answer that? You just twisted scripture again. That is not the question the Bible asks. The Bible says, if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you've not seen? I do love my brother whom I have seen, and I love God whom I've not seen, but I hate filthy perverts that molest children. He automatically equates homosexuality with pedophilia. Did you catch that? D do you see why I said it almost sounds like Anderson had some kind of bad experience years ago. And that's what's driving this. Again, I don't want to assume, but I'm getting that impression. I think you know where I'm going with that. I'll leave it at that. How do you, de how do you determine who your brothers are? Because the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So my brothers are those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not God-hating pedophiles. And how do you know? Again, equates homosexuality with pedophilia. Why is that? Ask yourself that question. Why is that? You know, if the people that you love have received God, based upon the testimony of their mouth. And how do you know that they'll be, how that their words are true? They could just be repeating the Bible or saying well, things that they know that you love to hear. How do you know that they have been born again of God? Well, I don't know for sure, but here's the thing. I don't hate all unsaved people. I love unsaved people. The only people I hate are reprobates, people that hate the Lord who've been turned over to a reprobate mind, according to Romans.
You hear it? According to Romans 1. one, Again, turned over to a reprobate mind. But read the context of Romans 1. The people who are turned over to a reprobate mind, it's pretty much every sin. It's not just homosexuality. It's idolatry. It's haters of God. It's, I think, slander is another one. I mean, it's just a whole laundry list of sins that every human has engaged in at least one of the sins in there. And so if all of these people are turned, I mean, if all of these sins are being spoken of as somebody who is turned over to reprobate mind, which is the case, and reprobate mind means that somebody's turned over to a mind state that could never repent, then nobody would ever be able to repent. It's just a really stupid understanding of Scripture. Frankly, these are people who don't exegete Scripture very well. They just go to proof texts and they assume and they repeat what they've heard. And it's not true. A reprobate mind, according to Romans 1, is not a mind of a person that could never repent. Read the context. It's apparent from that. So you can't say, well, because a homosexual is described as somebody who's turned over to reprobate mind, therefore they can never repent, so you have to hate them. But it also says these they're idol worshipers, and they're turned over to a reprobate mind. Haven't many idol worshipers converted to Christianity? That doesn't make sense in light of what Anderson is saying, hmm, I wonder if he has a faulty definition for what being turned over to reprobate mind means. I hate the homosexuals. I don't hate unsaved people. I don't hate Muslims. I don't hate Buddhists. I don't hate Hindus. I don't hate atheists. Well, hey, Hindus are pagans and idol worshipers, right? They're turned over to a reprobate mind, according to Romans 1. On what basis do you hate the homosexual, but not the Hindu for their idolatry? They're both described as people who are turned over to a reprobate mind. What? I okay. Anderson is good at memorizing scripture, but garbage at understanding it. I don't hate agnostics. I hate filthy pedophiles. May they all rot in hell. They're Do evil. You, again, this sounds like a person who's really hurt and wounded. It sounds like somebody did something to him. Um, you know, I, again, I'll I'll leave it at Do that. Do you love all people? Absolutely not. No. Then you love no one. That's another stupid statement from you that's not in the Bible. So was God said when God said we should even love our So every statement has to be in the in, in the Bible? I mean enemies. Did he mean everyone or some people? He did not mean everyone. He meant that we should love our enemies. I do love my personal <laughs> enemies, people that do wrong to me. I love them, but I don't love God's enemies. I love my enemies. But I do not love those who molest children and hate the Lord. Then you love no one. That's another stupid statement from you that makes no sense. Because God, no God if said you that. If you love everyone, then I say you love no one. Do you believe that God loved all people? Nope. He did love them in the past. He loved past tense all people. But they get to a point where God said in the book of Hosea, I will love them no more. Meaning he loved them in the past, but he doesn't love them anymore. Of course, he's ripping that right out of context. The group that he is saying, I will love them no more. Ripping out of context. And is that always the case where he says, I'll love them no more? It, he doesn't say anything else about that group? Because they've become a reprobate. So do you believe that God loved you? Because all sinners have reprobate, reprobated minds. When you're That's sinning... Awesome. See... Patterson caught that. All sinners have a reprobate mind. And you saw Anderson shaking his head saying that's false. Well, this is, again, Anderson able to quote a scripture but doesn't know the immediate context. And if you just read the immediate context of Romans chapter 1 where it speaks of a reprobate mind, it's talking about people who engage in pretty much every kind of sin out there. Not, not just homosexuality, but all kinds of other sins. And he's talking about humanity in general. So it's not like, well, it's a homosexual who also does all these other sins. No, he's talking about humanity in general, and he's broadly describing them. Some of them are idolaters. Some of them are homosexual. Some of them do this. Some of them do that. During the periods when you are sinning, do God love you in those moments? Absolutely, and no, all sinners do not have to. So reference. God loves you while you're sinning, but he doesn't love the homosexuals when they're sinning. Why does he have to say it like that? Homosexuals. Like, it, 
Okay. Because it's not the same thing. Do they? Does he love the the baby killers of unborn children when they're sinning? Yes. If they're not a reprobate, if they're not a god. -hate so he loves a baby killer, but n not a homosexual. This is where it's inconsistent for me. Um, a baby killer, really? <laughs> okay. Being reprobate, he does. Yeah. So, God loved the women who are killing unborn children in their wombs. Yes. He loved the men who are supporting that. But he, is yes. that a sin to kill? Do you see the extreme that Anderson has to go to? the absurdities that he has to maintain in order to just try to be consistent with his interpretation of scripture instead of saying, well, maybe I haven't thought through this very well. Maybe I'm wrong in the way that I've understood a reprobate mind. Your, your child or children in your womb. Yes, it is. So God loved the sinners who are killing yeah. unborn children in their wombs, but they don't love, he doesn't love the homosexuals. Right. He keeps saying homosexuals. Why? Why? That's so weird. Homosexuality is the only sin that is unique to reprobates, people that are rejected by God. No, no, no. Read Romans 1. Let's, let's just read the media. I keep saying read it. Let me just do it. Even though I know I've done it on the show before, we've gone over Romans chapter one multiple times but uh although they knew god they neither glorified him as god nor gave thanks to him but in their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened although they claimed to be wise they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal god for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles that's idolatry right therefore god gave them over to in sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity wait he's talking about pagans I, I, idol worshiper, uh, yeah. idol worshipers, idolaters. He's saying these people who have exchanged the truth of God for an idol, these people are turned over to their sinful desires. Notice that he's talking about idolaters and he turns them over to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies. Is every idolater a homosexual? Of course not. Uh, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is praised forever. Again, talking about idolatry. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Does every pagan idolater engage in homosexuality? Every female engages in homosexuality who's a female idolater? No. He's talking about in general trends within pagan nations he gives them up not necessarily every single individual so that they do ought what not to be done they have become filled with every kind of wickedness evil greed depravity they are full of envy murder strife deceit malice they are gossips gossips i mean we've all engaged in that right slanderers god haters insolent arrogant boastful they invent ways of doing evil they disobey their parents they have no understanding no fidelity no mercy uh, no love. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things de deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but they also approve of those who practice them. Okay, so there we see these people that are being turned over to a depraved mind, to the lust of the flesh, to these sins. And so it's not just the homosexual group that is um, depraved. It is everybody who is engaging in sin, period period and so a depraved mind is a reprobate mind is just simply somebody who is given over to sin any kind of sin but we all know a person who's given over to sin can still repent and and um be converted because it happened to us okay let's uh return back to the video god people who hate god they're the only people who do that homo stuff. Normal people have no temptation to be a homo. That's so the amazing. only people that are homos, the Bible tells us how they got that way in Romans 1, by rejecting and hating God. That sin is unique to them, according to Romans 1. Because you have accepted your sins as something that is normal to God, is it possible that you're judging others because you're still in a fallen state? You, you may be able to quote the Bible. Is it possible you have justified your sins 
and that you're judging other based on what you think is right, but not what you know is right. Is that possible? Absolutely not. I don't justify my sins. My sins are wrong. You're the one who justifies your sins by claiming that. Do you hear how delusional he is? I don't justify my sins. Not possible that you could do that, huh? Not possible, Pastor Anderson. You couldn't possibly justify your sins. It's not within your capability. You have no sin when you sin every day. But you're you justify, you justify sinning. You you allow yourself to make excuses for being a preacher, and say you're called by God, and for sinning. Is that is isn't that justification? You are a sinner and justifying and it. You sin during this broadcast. I've observed you sinning during this broadcast. Is that a sin to justify sinning? I don't justify sinning. I condemn sin. I condemn all sin, including my own sin. I don't justify sin. You're, you justify your own sin. You want me to point out the sins you've done in this broadcast? Do you believe that God, there are times when God sinned? No. And are you a son of God? Yes. And if you're a son of God, how can you deviate from your father who is perfect in all things and sin sometimes. How can you serve Satan and God? You can't ride. You see how he's also twisting scripture just as bad as Anderson? I two horses at the same time. Because how my, are you able to ride two horses at the same time? You serve Satan by sinning, and then you serve God, as you said, by not sinning. How can you serve two masters? Well, you know what? My spirit is saved. My spirit's a son of God. How are you able to serve two masters? You only serve Satan, so you don't have that problem. How are you able to serve? How are you able to serve two masters? You only serve one, and that's no. I'm asking you. How are you able to serve two masters? Two masters. You serve sin, which is Satan, and you serve God, which is not. You said so. You say you're serving two masters. I wonder if any of your listeners are stupid enough to think that you don't sin. No, no, no. You're not answering my question. How are you able to serve two masters? Avoid foolish questions. You're not in, in, other, in other words, when you can't answer the question, just say avoid foolish questions. Okay. No, I'm not. God said you can't serve two masters. You either love one or hate the other. Well, God said you're going to hell because you don't have to. No, you either love hate one or hate it. Do you love your sins? Nope. Then why you do them? Thank you, Pastor Anderson. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. Well, you can go to hell because you're a false prophet. Amazing. Right? Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound very loving. I mean, I don't think Pastor or no, uh, Lee Patterson here. I don't think that he's a homosexual. I don't think he's that. So why do you have to say such a hateful thing to him? Why? <laughs> wow. Oh wow. This is what happens when people get tangled into a web of confusion you know i've seen this with even catholics who get so confused they're, they're like this tangled ball of yarn right and it, you know that you could untangle it you know if you if you really just spent 10 hours trying to uh, especially if it's like a you know 50 foot ball of yarn or something you could you know that you could do it but it would take so long because the person has really jumbled themselves and got themselves confused. I've seen it with Catholics, see it with Protestants. I'm seeing it here by both of these guys. Wow. Proof that you can know scripture and not understand it. Wow. What are y'all's thoughts there? Like to hear them at Reason and Theology. Go ahead and uh, send a couple comments, questions. I'll take a few for about five minutes here, and then I'm going to head out because this is the third show for the day. So, All right. Well, uh, looking through the chat to see if there's anything already. Not seeing anything. What did y'all think of it? Did, did y'all think that either one of them were reasonable? I'm, I'm just curious. To me, neither one of them were reasonable. Neither one of them knew scripture. Uh, Michael A. says, amazing. I agree. I, that's that's my assessment. Amazing conversation uh, about homosexuals. And so, let's see. Uh, this was the worst thing I've ever watched. <laughs> uh, says Sean. 
uh mcginnis um <laughs> i told you get ready i it was uh really interesting the first time that i saw it and uh even watching it the second time here it still remains so uh i think we need to pray for pastor anderson yeah absolutely of course uh, because only prayer and grace is going to untangle that ball of yarn. Um, there's, wow, a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, Candid Catholic says it was con, con comic relief. Uh, hallelujah, Pastor Anderson is a very damaged person. I get that impression as well. Um, I think some things happened to him in the past that's kind of driving this. There there's no way that you would specifically conclude that particular sin is the only thing that uh, can't be redeemed unless you there's something personal going on there. Um, uh, Bianca says, I can't believe you forced me to agree with Stephen Anderson against my will tonight. On what? <laughs> I want to know what you agreed on. Uh, Jesse Lee Peterson is at least more sensible than Puro Anderson. You know, uh, <laughs> it, at some points, he he was a little bit more reasonable at some points. But then Anderson was uh, more reasonable at some other points, you know, saying that, for example, that everybody sins, you know, even people who are regenerate. That's true. Um, we should pray for people to be converted. Absolutely. Of course, never stop to do so. Uh, what else we got? Um, Jesse never gets upset. I don't know. Is that true? I, I don't really watch any of his videos. This is the second video that I've seen, uh, from this Jesse guy. So I don't know if that's the case. Um, I think that Jesse Lee Peterson was using less precise theological language to force Anderson to think maybe, but I also think that um peterson was misunderstanding scripture and didn't know what he was uh trying to argue himself um let's see if steven anderson were to convert i feel like he'd just go sit a <laughs> i get that rigorous vibe from him as well um and that idea that you know, no, nobody is as pure as I am. And so you would kind of end up in the set of a contest camp. So I, I could see that. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and end it there. I hope you all enjoyed it. We're going to be doing some more of these more re fun review shows. And like I said, we're going to get back to our call ins as well. I meant to do that today, but it didn't. Didn't happen, but it will. So we'll, we'll be doing some, uh, Let's see. Open mic with mics again. So get ready for that. Y'all can call in, ask me questions, send me chat questions. We'll do that uh, soon. Maybe maybe we can even do one tomorrow. We'll see how it goes. Thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Check us out. Patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us too. Till next time. We'll see you. God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248 431 1440. If you care about the pro life cause, call them now.